Good morning, everybody. I need somebody to give me a thumbs up here on Zoom that you can hear me and see me, please. You can hear me and see me? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Everybody, please open up your source sheets. This is important because we're going to uh, learn inside today. So please open your source sheets. You can go to theyeshiva.net, theyeshiva.net, the first featured class, Tuesday women's class, and you'll see on top there's a green icon, download. Open it up, and you can open your source sheets, download it. Okay. Somebody can also take it, take the file and post it here in the chat on uh, the Zoom so all the Zoom participants can enjoy it as well. Let's begin. As usual, we'll take questions afterwards. Okay, if you didn't do it yet, go to theyeshiva.net and please download the source sheets because the text is going to be important today. On top of the featured video, you have download, you can download your source sheets. Somebody can also post it on Zoom, a link on Zoom if you know how to do that. So our uh, participants on Zoom can also, can also uh, follow along. Today's class is dedicated by our dear friends, Liz and Dr. Michael Michelle, in loving memory of her father whose 21st yard site is going to be on the 11th day of Tevis, this coming Shabbos. Harav Yisrael Yitzchak Halevi, Ben Harav Binyamin, who passed away 21 years ago on the 11th day of Tevis. Rabbi Irving Levi, Zechrein Levracha, was one of the founding fathers of the Muncie community when he settled back in 1952, he was an exceptional Talmud Chacham, a Torah scholar, an extraordinary Baal Chesed, a person of benevolence, generosity, and kindness who built together with his wife of blessed memory a beautiful home and an exceptional family. He helped countless people with charity, with tzedakah, and invaluable life guidance, career advice, marital advice, financial advice. He was a life coach and a social activist and Askin before these terms were known. He made weddings for girls who had no one else to help. He established careers and life direction for those who were floundering. He helped so many Jews who found themselves in desperate situations and had nowhere else to turn. A legendary Balchesed and a good to better for his entire family, and I thank our dear friends, Liz and Dr. Michelle, here in Muncie, for their friendship and partnership. Please open up your source sheets, and we're going to begin today with a a few verses in Mishle. Chapter 6 of Mishle, Proverbs, Perik Vav, begins. This is the advice of the author of Mishle, King Solomon, Shloim HaMelech. Let's look inside at his words. Mishle, chapter 6, I read. 
Bini, my son, If you have stood surety for your fellow, given your hand for another, we'll soon explain what this means. You have been trapped by the words of your mouth, sneered by the words of your mouth. Do this, my son, in order to extricate yourself. Because you have come into the power of your fellow. This is what you have to do. Go humble yourself and badger your friend. Give your eyes no sleep and your pupils no slumber. Save yourself like a deer out of the hand of the hunter like a bird out of the hand of the trapper, of the fowler. What is Mishle chapter 6 talking about? Let's look at Rashi. It says Rashi, B'ni marafta arvus momoin kemashmai pishu rabbiseinu. My son, if you have stood surety, our sages explain this as referring to monetary arvus. You have decided to become a guarantor to a lender to pay up somebody else's loan. Somebody needed money, they came to a lender, the lender doesn't want to give them the money without an ori, without somebody to guarantee and secure the loan. You have accepted upon yourself the responsibility, you have assumed the role of an orev. Arvus is a guarantor, an orev, in order to pay up the other person's debt. And now what happens? <laughs> the borrower did not pay the money, you have stretched out your hand for a stranger. In other words, you have taken his hand in friendship and assumed responsibility for him, but he never paid. So what should you do? You have made commitments. You have made commitments, and now the burden is on you. You have this huge debt to pay. So what is Shleim Melech giving advice to his son? If he did this, if he fell in, so to speak, to this trap, apparently it wasn't such a... Uh, it may have not always been such a kosher situation. You would maybe try to be a nice guy or whatever. But you got stuck. What should you do? Lechis rapis. What's lechis rapis? Says Rashi, Hater loy pas yad l'shalom loy mamoinoi. It's a combination of two words. Israpis says, Hater pas. Open the palm of your hand for him to pay him his money. In other words, make sure. Don't remain indebted to people for years and decades and centuries and lives. You don't want to maintain negativity and grudges. Open up the palm of your hand and make sure you pay back your money. Hisrapis means go humble yourself, but Rashi says it's a combination of two words. Hater pas. Go and pay back the money. Urahav reyecha. What's urahav reyecha? Literally it means give your fellow superiority. Extol him. Says Rashi. What if there's no monetary issue? It's not like you promised money, you accepted that you're going to pay money and you never paid, you fell short. But it's only an issue of words. Maybe you insulted him. You got trapped by your mouth saying the wrong thing, something rude, insensitive, obnoxious, selfish. Apologize. And if need, bring many friends to ask him to forgive you. Urahav reyecha. He says, it means extol your friend. And Rashi says what it means is, Urahav, bring many friends in order to get him to forgive you. Make mens. This is the advice that the brilliant man, King Solomon Shleim HaMelech, is giving his child about civil, about human relationships. Says Rashi, Dover Acher. There is another way of interpreting these verses. They are allegorical. Bni, my son, imei rafta l'reyacha. Source, page, page two in the source sheets. Imei rafta l'reyacha. If you have become a guarantor for your friend, it's not if, it's a fact. Acher shana se sa ariv la kadosh baruch hu shereyacha. Since you have become a guarantor for the creator of the world because he is considered your friend. Kidik siv zed doi divizerei. In the song of songs chapter five. We define Hashem as my beloved and my friend. You have become a guarantor. You undertook at Sinai and in the plains of Moyav with a, with a complete commitment and an oath to observe His commandments. You have become a guarantor. A guarantor makes a commitment that I am going to pay this loan. You made a commitment to the Creator of the world 
that you belong to him, that you are going to be a conduit for his love and energy in the world, and he's considered your friend. But now what happens? You have given your hand to a stranger. You turned away from your commitment, and you may have clung to heresy and to follow the ways of those who are not aligned with the will of your Creator. Says Rashi, you have been trapped by the sayings of your mouth, you have given your hand to cling to strangers. Says Shloyma Melech, let me give you my dear son advice. Since you have come into the palm of your friend at Sinai, you have come into his palm and you have accepted his godliness on you. You have become a guarantor. Go humble yourself. Humble yourself before him like the threshold. Become completely humble, a conduit for him. And bring other friends, many friends who will pray for you before God. This is how the Medrash explains these verses. Hasten and extricate yourself from there like a deer that extricates itself from the hunter's trap. You ever see a deer running away from the predator who tries to kill it or trap it? You ever saw the, the antelope, the gazelle, the deer running away? You be, you be that deer. Run away. This is the second interpretation. So Rashi presented two interpretations to these opening powerful verses of Mishle chapter 6. One is it's dealing with human relationships. I have taken a commitment and now I want to back out because of obvious difficulties and challenges. I didn't realize what I'm getting into. He says, no, don't run away from the situation. Deal with it. Pay back your loan. You insulted somebody. Make amends. You need to bring in other people to make peace. Let it not be beyond your dignity. The dignity of friendship and of honesty and of loyalty and of maintaining good relationships trumps all else. Not bad advice in life, if I may say so. Not that Shlema Malach needs my agreement, but we all know that it's very bad, good advice. How do we know it's good advice? Because it's difficult. <laughs> sometimes it's difficult to do. We sometimes choose to be right rather than to be happy and honest. Sometimes the ego or the fear of the insecurity triumphs over the deeper need and yearning for integrity and wholesomeness and authentic relationships and honesty in life. That's advice number one, one perspective. The second perspective is talking about our relationship with the creator of the world. You have become a guarantor to follow Hashem's path at Sinai. You're going to live a certain way, and then sometimes I get trapped. My mouth traps me, my behavior traps me, and I give a stranger my hand. So he says, get out of it. Accept you have given your, 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 your friend, Hashem is your friend, his hand. So what does Rashi say? It's time to humble yourself, and if you need to bring in other people to help you in the relationship, do this. Why am I mentioning, why are we learning chapter 6 of Proverbs today? And by the way, right after that, Shlaim HaMelech goes and gives advice to go learn from ants how to live. Learn from ants what it means to be agile, what it means to be, to have perseverance, what it means to transcend, la- transcend laziness. That's the continuation of this chapter in Proverbs, but that's for another class. Why are we learning this today? Because of a fascinating medrash right in the opening of Parshas Vayigash. Medrash Rabbah. Parshas Vayigash, chapter 93, section 1 in Medrash Rabbah Vayigash, quotes these verses in Mishle, and in a fascinating commentary, applies these verses to one particular incident in the genesis of our history. And that's, of course, the history, the, the story described in Vayeshev, Miketz, and Vayigash. Let's recall this aspect of the story. Yosef became the viceroy of Egypt. His brothers come down to purchase grain in Egypt because they have no food. There's a terrible famine all over the Fertile Crescent. They don't recognize their brother. Their brother says and accuses them of being spies. He wants them to go back to Eretz Yisrael, Knaan, and bring back their baby brother, Binyamin. Their father does not want to allow Binyamin to go because he has already lost his other brother, Yosef, and Shimon has been imprisoned by Yosef. So he really refuses to let Binyamin go, but everyone is starving. And that's when Yehuda, considered the king of the tribes, the lion, goes over to his father and says, 
Give me Binyamin. Anoichi Arvenu. I will become his guarantor. This is the first time we find the guarantor in the Tanakh. I will be the guarantor. Mi yodi tevakshenu. You will demand him from my hand. If I do not bring him back to you, if we take him to Egypt and I don't return him, I will be considered a sinner to you my entire life. And Yaakov ultimately acquiesces and he gives Binyamin to Yehuda, Binyamin the baby brother to Yehuda. He wasn't such a baby, but he was the youngest brother. And indeed, it's not so simple because as we know, Yosef has his personal silver goblet stored, stocked, hidden in the sack of Binyamin and he is caught and he is arrested and brought back to Egypt, and the Prime Minister of Egypt, Yosef, says, let him remain here as a slave because he stole my goblet, and you go back to your father. And that's where Parshish Vayigash begins, Vayigash of Yehuda. Yehuda approaches the Prime Minister of Egypt, who is really his brother Yosef, but he doesn't know it. And he repeats the whole story, and at the end he says, I cannot go back to my father without this boy. I have taken responsibility. I am the guarantor, and my father will not survive losing another child, Binyamin, and therefore I will be your slave. Let Binyamin go back home to his father. I will become your slave because I cannot go back and see the pain of my father when he discovers that Binyamin is going to remain in Egypt as the slave of the Prime Minister. And that's the moment that Yosef can't contain himself anymore. And he discloses his true identity to his brothers. Ani Yosef ha'oid avichai. I am Yosef as my brother still alive. Comes the Medrash. And in a very interesting and intriguing and fascinating interpretation says, Yehuda is the first guarantor. That's what Shleim HaMelech is referring to. Let's see the Medrash. Dover Acher. Bini my son. Imarafta l'reacha. If you have become a guarantor for your friend Zeh Yehuda. This is an intimation to Yehuda who told his father, I will guarantor the boy. You have given a stranger your hand. You have given an oath. You know, you give somebody a hand representing um, a deal, an agreement of a respectable person. You don't go back on a handshake. You have given a stranger your hand. Remember he said, from my hand, you will demand Binyamin. You have given you, Yaakov your hand, your commitment. You became trapped through the words of your mouth. You told Yaakov, if I don't bring him back to you, I will remain a sinner to you all my life. You became trapped by the words of your mouth. You said that you will bring back Binyamin under all circumstances, no matter what happens. Even as it turns, if it turns out Binyamin, so to speak, sp- stole the Prime Minister's goblet. It's not your fault that he stole it. Of course, they didn't know that it was all you know, pre-orchestrated by the Viceroy of Egypt. They thought Binyamin indeed stole it. But they didn't know what happened. So you got trapped by the words of your mouth. So he says, this is my son, what you have to do to save yourself, to extricate yourself. Leich, what does he say? Hisrapis. Go humble yourself and go turn your friend into a king. Extol him. Make him great. Badger him. Surrender yourself to him. Go become his doormat. Go, not go, go connect to the dust of his feet, meaning go humble yourself completely and plead with him. Accept his kingship and his rulership. That's indeed what Yehuda does. He approaches Yosef, completely surrenders and humbles himself to Yosef. Goes through the whole story and says, I will become your slave. So the Medrash sees this advice that a father gives a son in Proverbs chapter 6 as referring to the story of Yehuda becoming a guarantor for Binyamin and then pleading with Yosef, accepting Yosef as the king and saying, you're the ruler and I will become your slave, but please let my baby brother go back home. Now, it's very obvious that there is an interesting stroke of of, of genius or certainly a very intriguing similarity the Medrash sees and says, oh, this works perfectly with Yehuda, but what really do we gain from this insight? So now we know that in Proverbs, when a father tells his son, go make sure 
to pay back your debts. And if you become a guarantor, you stay true to your commitment. Okay, this explains what happens to Yehuda. Does it give insight into the story of Yehuda and Yosef? Does it give insight into the advice of Shleim HaMalach? What do we gain from this connection, from this uh, synthesis or juxtaposition combining together these, these two events? I want to introduce another medrash. In the same chapter, Medrash Rabbah Vayigar, chapter 93, section 11. Take a look. Rebbe Laza ben Azariah Omer. Omar. Rebbe Laza ben Azariah, one of the greatest sages of the second century after the common era. Says, Oy lanu miyoyim adin, oy lanu miyoyim atarchecha. Woe is it to us when we think about the day of judgment, the day of rebuke. If Yosef HaTzadik, who was a human being of flesh and blood, and yet when he rebuked his brothers, they could not withstand it. Hashem, who was the ultimate judge, who sits on the throne of judgment and who judges every individual, certainly no mortal human being will be able to withstand God's rebuke. The Blessed Ben Azariah asks us to reflect on a story in Vayigash and draw from this a lesson into our own responsibilities to God. The big question is, Yosef never rebuked his brothers. In fact, they were terrified when he disclosed his identity to them, it says they could not speak. Niv halumiponov, they were astounded, they were, they, were, they were shocked. They were terrified. And Yosef calmed them down and he said, don't be depressed. Atal teyatsu, don't be despondent, don't be melancholy. You didn't send me, God sent me here to be able to save the world, to be able to save you. Come back with your families, bring my father. Yosef didn't rebuke them. Your beloved Azariah says, if they couldn't deal with the rebuke of Yosef, how are we going to deal with the rebuke of God? What is the meaning of this? Please go to page three in your source sheet. Now we begin the explanation. The explanation is based on the Hasidic work known as Sfasemes. Sfasemes, I've mentioned quite a few times, is one of the classic Hasidic works on Chumash. There's also a commentary on Gemara, on Shas, known as Sfasemes by the same author, was authored by Rabbi Yehuda Aryeh Leib Alter, the second Rebbe of the Hasidic dynasty of Ger, or Gur. His Zayd, his grandfather, was the Chidushi Harim, Rabbi Yitzchak Meir, Rabbi Meir Alter, who passed away Tofer Yish Chavov, 1866. And he raised Rabbi Yehuda Leib Alter. He was an orphan. His mother died shortly after he was born. Then his father died. So his grandfather, the Chidush Harim, the first Gera Rebbe, raised him. And after his grandfather's passing, a few years later, he was still very young, he became the Gera Rebbe, known as the Svasemes. He was born in 1847 in Warsaw, and he passed away in 1905, Heishvat Tofresh Samachay, January 11th, 1905, in the city of Gur, which is approximately 25 kilometers or so south of Warsaw. Svasemis' commentary on Chumash is very short, very brief, very concise, very cryptic. It contains extraordinary gems of insight. And it follows the pattern of the teachings of the Baal Shem Tev and his students in the world of Chassidus. And here, I chose a piece from the Svasemes. It's from the year Tofresh Lamed Beis. He said, Vayigash Tofresh Lamed Beis, that would be 17, uh, 1872. Take a look inside. It's brief. It's short, it's hard to understand, it needs to be deciphered. Let's try to decipher it together. It has life-changing advice. He quotes the Medrash. You already know the whole Medrash. I gave you the background. We learned the Medrash about the guarantor. We learned the Medrash about 
the rebuke of Yosef. Let's see what the Svasama says. The Medrash, the Medrash says, "Bni Chuli or after Chuli, Tekatel Zar Kapecha Chuli Kabbal Adenusay." He's basically quoting briefly a few words from the Medrash, which we already learned about Yehuda being the guarantor. On a literal level, it's a very technical Medrash. Yehuda made a promise, deliver on it. But as I said, there has to be some deeper connection. What is the Medrash really trying to teach us? Says the Svasemes, and I quote, "Ki Adam." A person was created with a purpose, and the purpose was to align everything with the oneness of the world, with Hashem. Everything is really one. Everything is part of divine, of the divine reality. But this is the human being's job to reveal it, to bring everything close, to show that everything is part of God every person, every creature, every existence, every aspect of life. We make a, you drink a cup of coffee as I'm drinking, before we drink, before I started to drink, we make a blessing. Blessed are you, God, our God, the King of the world, for everything came into existence from His Word. Not only the water, the water as well, but everything else. The job of a person is to bring everything close to Hashem. The cause of the Pasuk says, Shlema Melech tells us, God actually made a person straight. A person naturally, organically is aligned with his or her inner core. There is a seamless flow between your innermost divine core and you. There is a oneness. He made you straight. He made you aligned. But Vehema Bikshu Cheshboinus Rabbim. But then our brains often take us down winding paths as we seek adventure that can distort our vision of reality. If a person would not go off and compromise his or her true energy, the organic state of a person is complete dveikas, complete intimate oneness and alignment with Hashem. We're part of Hashem. The expression of the Zoya, Yisrael v'kutshabrichu kulachat. Everything really is an aspect of divine energy. So the organic, the wholesome, the natural state of a human being, if you can have an x-ray into your soul, into your brain, an x-ray into your 70 trillion, 70, approximately 70 trillion cells, and with each cell, the natural organic state of human being is dveikas. Alignment with your core, with your source, because einoid movada. That's the meaning of the word Shlema Melech starts the Pasuk. He says, Arafta. Right? You remember the first source? What was the opening verse of Mishle Perik Vav? The opening Pasuk. Bni im Arafta Literally, if you became a guarantor to your friend. Who's your friend? Hashem. Why is he called your friend? Zerei, Zedoidi. He's your best friend. A friend is your closest ally. You're one with God. He's your best friend. Rashi says in Masech the Shabbos, the Aflamet Aleph, Hillel told the convert, the, the non-Jew who wanted to convert, teach me the whole Torah on one foot. He asks Hillel, what does Hillel say? What you dislike to be done to you, don't do it to your friend. So Rashi says, one of the interpretations, who's your friend? Hashem. Like we see, like Rashi says here, He's your friend. What's a rafta? So he says, Arafta Lashin Eruv. The word Arafta, a guarantor, comes from the word Eruv, which means La'arev, to mix. Taruvis is a mixture. Sheyesh Lai Eruv, Echibur Lagdusha Besherish Nishmasai. You are naturally aligned and connected to holiness, to sacredness, to divinity because of your own root, because of the core, the root of who you are, your soul. Your soul is a chelek, eleka, mimal, mamash, as the Tanya says. A piece of God, a fragment of infinity. You have become a guarantor for your friend, but it's not a stranger who becomes a guarantor. It's your best friend because you're really one. You're really connected. This is who you are. You are divine. You are God's ambassador in the world to reveal the oneness of Hashem in the world because you are an aspect of that oneness and you are an ambassador of that oneness as we always, as we talk about pretty often. Umemele kol habriya nichna tachtov. Wonderful words. And therefore, the whole world is your best friend. 
the whole world literally is saying is subservient to you. Now we have to understand what he means. I mean the whole world is subservient to you. It doesn't mean I should become a narcissist. It means when I am truly an ambassador of the divine, when I realize that who am I? I'm an aspect of Hashem. I'm sent by Hashem into this world to reveal the oneness. The whole world is singing with me. The whole world is really God's world. So the whole world is my best. The world is my best friend. Everything in the world is here to assist me. Because who am I? I am not detached. If I become a detached person, if I become fragmented, if I lose the plot, if I become disaligned with the truest nature of who I am, in other words, with my inner infinity, then, as we will see, the world becomes a very difficult place for me. But when I am truly loyal to me, what does it mean? I am part of an Arev. I'm an Arev. Taruvis, Erev. Reminds me of the Baal Shem Tev Svart who said, Kol Yisrael Arevim Zebazeh. The Gemara says, in Shavuos, all Jews are guarantors for each other, which means we're responsible for each other. As Rav Shem famously says in Zoya, you know, I'm in a boat. And I can't make a hole in my corner of the boat and says, this is my bedroom. This is my bedroom in the Titanic. It's none of your business. I can make a hole in my boat. The problem is a hole in my boat causes the boat, to go, the entire boat to be endangered. What does I rave mean? We're not only guarantors for each other. There's a reason we're guarantors for each other. Because we're mixed up with each other. I rave him. Mu'uravim. Famished. And of course, he also gave the interpretation, I rave him from the word sweet. Vaharevna. Vaseyarevna. A rave is sweet. So the Baal Shem Tov said, one Jew experiences sweetness when he or she meets another Jew. A rave him. When you see a Jew, you want to feel sweetness. You know when you're drinking your coffee or your tea and you need your sugar cube to be able to make it sweet, if you're allowed to have sugar, or if you like sugar, you want sugar, he says, you see another Jew, ah, this is my sugar cube. I rave him, Zabazah. It sweetens me. A, a Jew. He says, Ain yid is this for ananda yid. It's my sugar cube. It sweetens my life. I see a Jew, ah, kishmak. Why? Because I rave him, Zabazah. Because we're integrated, we're one. If I don't like you, it's because I don't like me, my essence. I rave him, Zabazah. And therefore, we're guarantors for each other. So that's what Sfasema says. You're a guarantor for God. What does it mean you're a guarantor for God? You're one with God. You're God's man in this world. You're his ambassador in the world. And the whole world, therefore, is part of you. The whole world is here for you. The whole world is here for you to be able to fulfill your purpose, your mission. The world is your best friend. Ah, this is a very idealistic statement, right? It says, Ah, adam chas v'shalem. Sometimes a person becomes disaligned with who he or she is. And instead, I become dovok, I become addicted, I become entrenched in behaviors, in a lifestyle, in thought processes that are alien to my truest spiritual infinity. I give my hand to a stranger. This is where the person's passion and addictions and cravings and yearnings become entrenched in things that are not productive for you. They don't promote your oneness. They don't promote your well-being. They don't build your physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual, financial identity. They don't allow you to live as an ambassador of infinity in the world, as an ambassador of God. What happens is I take my hand, I take my heart, I take my passion, I take my commitments, and I sell them. I surrender my soul to pursuits or to thoughts that are not good for me. They're immoral. Now, sometimes it's done in a premeditated fashion, but really very often it's done because it's my survival skills. I don't even know. I don't even know who I really am. And I need this to survive. I think I need this to survive. And what happens now is, instead of the world being my best friend, everything appears as dark, as a struggle as adversity, as my enemy. The verse says in Job and Eiv, we create our energy. Our energy creates what comes to us. 
In other words, I unleash a certain energy in the world based on my behaviors and my thoughts, and that's what comes back to me. Poyal Adam, what a person creates, Yishulam Lai, it comes back to haunt a person. So the Svasemes is saying something very profound. He's saying, when I realize that I am divine, I realize that I'm infinite, I realize that I'm a messenger of God in this world to reveal the oneness in the world, the whole world is smiling at me. It's like that story I once told you. It's a great anecdote about this boy who would go to school every day. It was just a few minute walk, so he would walk there and walk back. One day it started to rain in the afternoon and there was a thunderstorm, so the mother didn't want that her son should walk home alone. So she drove to the school, but she sees he's not there anymore. The teacher said that he lent her and he started to walk. So she starts driving on the road past from the school to the house to try to find him and get him in the car. And she sees he's walking slowly and he's in such a cheerful mood. And every time there's a lightning, he looks up and he smiles. So she opens the window. She says, come in, come in. He says, no, I'm enjoying the weather. I want to walk home. She says, why are you smiling? He says, God keeps him taking. God keeps on taking pictures of me. So every time God takes a picture, I look up and I smile. He saw the world from a space of alignment, of unity. The world is smiling at me. And this Fasema says, it's true. Because you're the ambassador of the creation, of the creator, to reveal the creator in the creation. As the expression of the Balatanya. To reveal the to reveal in everything its true soul. So you see everywhere that opportunity because the whole world is really God. The whole world is an aspect of Hashem. The Baal Shem Tev said, God is Alts. Un Alts is God. Hashem is everything and everything is Hashem. Ein Oid Mulvade. There's nothing outside of that reality. So when I am aligned with that reality, I see everything as part of that reality. It's here to help me flex my muscles and achieve my purpose in one way or another. When I detach from that part of myself, Takata Lazar Kapecha, instead of being a guarantor to my best friend, Instead of being a guarantor, become being one with my best friend. What does it mean, my best friend? My biggest ally in the world. It's interesting. God is called my best friend. Not a many people, uh, not, not everybody turn, defines God as their best friend. How do you try to define God? But this is what the Pasuk says in Mishle. This is what the Pasuk says in Shashirim. This is what the Pasuk says. This is what the Gemara says in Masechus Shabbos. God is your best friend. Your best friend means the one who wants you to succeed, the one who forgives you, the one, the one who wants to see you maximize your life, the one who wants to see you live life to the fullest. That's your best friend. That's what a good friend is. Fagine, a fagine, wants your success. I was interviewed the other day by somebody. So, so he, he asked me, how do you know who to ask advice by? How do you know who to ask advice by? I said... It's a good question, but the first prerequisite is somebody who wants to see you fly. Somebody who wants to see you succeed. Somebody who wants to see you live the best possible life on every level. That's the first prerequisite. Extremely important. So Hashem is defined as my best friend. Instead of becoming aligned with my best friend, meaning with my truest yearnings and essence, because a best friend is out for me, not for him. Instead, Instead, I surrender myself to a stranger. A stranger who's basically not interested in me. But somehow I feel that this is where I'm going to get the source of my nourishment. Because if I can't feel that, if I'm not aware of that powerful connection, if I'm not aware of who I really am, so now I'm looking for myself. So this person becomes addicted to binging. And this person becomes addicted to gambling. And this person becomes addicted to screens. And this person becomes addicted to other things that I don't have to mention. And this person becomes addicted to alcohol. And this person becomes addicted to nicotine. And this person becomes addicted to destructive substances. This person becomes addicted to compliments. This person becomes addicted to criticism. This person becomes addicted to fear. Shame, self-loathing, insecurity. What happened? I sell myself, I give myself away to a stranger. My passion, my craving, my heart was now eaten up somewhere else. And you know what happens now? Now basically I'm living in a difficult world. I'm living in a challenging world. I'm living in a dark world. There's so much darkness around me. And 
A classic example for this is what happened when they sold Yosef. Because they sold him and they distanced themselves from his brotherhood. They made believe he's estranged, even though he was a brother, they could not get along with him, and therefore they sold him. Suddenly here in this story, he appears as their enemy. Really, he is their brother. Wow. You get what this Fasemis is saying here? Yehuda is approaching the Prime Minister of Egypt. He thinks he's speaking to his enemy. If you would ask Yehuda, who are you speaking to? He would say, I'm speaking to one of the toughest tyrants in the world. Somebody who accused us of espionage. Somebody who has been torturing us and persecuting us and abusing us. The Medrash indeed says how Yehuda was planning to kill him and destroy Egypt. They saw Yosef as their enemy. As their nightmare. Here is the man who is their nightmare again and again and again. What was the truth? The truth is he was their brother. The truth is he was their brother. And indeed when he reveals himself, as we'll soon see, they realize he was their brother. And he was their brother who did not plan revenge. But in their perception, who were they talking to? They were talking to their enemy. How did this happen? Says this Fasemis, because our mindset creates reality. They were the ones who decided Yosef was their enemy. They were the ones who decided Yosef is not our brother. They were the ones who decided that there's no place in our family for Yosef. That's where they wanted to kill him. They threw him into a pit and then they drew him out of the pit and they sold him into slavery and they distanced him from the family and they created the impression that Yosef was devoured by a wild animal by dipping his tunic in blood and sending the bloody tunic of Yosef to Yaakov Avinu who began to weep and say, Torah Torah Yosef. My son was devoured, the wild animal has consumed him. And now what happens? They're looking at their brother, their brother who does not want to harm them. He does not want Binyamin as a slave. Binyamin is his brother. But what do they see? They see an enemy. What is the Svas Emes telling us? And I want you to listen to this. And I'm, I'm talking to myself first. What you and I sometimes think is, the, is my greatest enemy in life is really my best friend. Think about those things that challenge you most and it always begins inside. The thoughts, the fears, the wounds, the scars, the traumas. This is my darkness in life. This is what I want to get rid of. And it's normal. Don't judge it. It's normal. I am in that place of fragmentation. But really, really, if I can go back to alignment, if I can go back to dvekas, if I can go back to oneness with the source, then I realize the oneness in the world. That which is challenging me most is really my deepest opportunity for growth. My greatest adversary is really my best friend. Now this sounds strange, what, he's not my best friend. Yes, superficially, he is not your best friend. These thoughts are not my best friends. These wounds are not my best friends. These scars are not my best friends. These fears are not my best friends. This prime minister of Egypt is my nightmare. He causes me or she causes me or it causes me sleepless nights. But that's because of my own neural pathways who have redefined the world as a jungle rather than as a space of love. Now, I'm going to ask you, please do not hear these words as a judgment, because if you're hearing it as judgment, you're falling into the trap that the Svasemis is warning us against, right? Like if you're now telling yourself, I know, and I'm guilty, and I'm even more, <laughs> and I'm even more messed up than I think I'm messed up, because I don't know what he, Rabbi Jacobson is talking about, you missed the plan again. So I'm going to ask you to look at these words with feel, feel the love, feel the compassion, This is not judging you. This is helping each of us open ourselves up to another way of looking at reality, but not blaming yourself or judging yourself because perhaps this for you or for me was a survival skill. And I can guarantee, in the most guarantee, I can guarantee, we're talking about guarantees, that in most cases that's what it is. So you have to have compassion that these are the survival skills that I was forced to develop and now I want to open my neural pathways to another opportunity. And the other opportunity is can I see myself as aligned with absolute infinity? Meaning, my scars don't define me, my trauma doesn't define me. 
the events of my life that were so difficult and restricted my consciousness so deeply, they don't define me. What they did do is they turned the world into a very dark place and they turned me into a dark person. And they turned my brother into my enemy and it's all my own perception. <clears throat> every trauma, every pain, every difficult emotion you're facing is really divine energy helping you to bring you back to your truest greatness as an ambassador of the divine in this world, helping you fulfill your mission. This doesn't mean it's not painful. This doesn't mean it doesn't warrant many tears. This doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It does mean that the whole world is yours. The whole world is singing with you. You are a chelek elekamimal. You're invincible. You're God's light in this world. Everything is here to help you spread your light. Everything. So that pain that I'm facing, that I'm confronting, don't see it as your enemy. It's here to bring out your truest potential, to make you aware of your deepest reality and of the deepest reality of the world. But when I don't look at it that way, then I am living in a world of darkness. I'm living in a world of enemies. I'm living in a world of betrayal. I'm living in a world of distrust. And a lot of us are living in that world. I cannot trust. How could I trust? When I trusted as a four-year-old or as a 10-year-old, I was backstabbed. When I trusted as a 12-year-old, I was hurt. And when I trusted as a 20-year-old, I was yet hurt again. I stopped trusting. I closed myself off to myself and to the world. I wanted love. But I was betrayed, so now all I seek is attention or validation or some other form of filling the void and numbing the pain. And the anxiety and the stress that I'm experiencing is all part of that. Can I open myself up to another opportunity? So he says, you know why Yosef is their enemy? It was their own doing. He was their brother. But this is the power of a person's thoughts, of a person's attitudes. Let's now go further. So in conclusion, the world is yours. Yosef is your brother. You decided he's your enemy. You ran away from him because you were running away from yourself. You were running away from your own life. Don't blame yourself. Maybe for you it was survival, but that's what happened. So he becomes my enemy, but only in my perception. And that's the story I tell myself. He's my enemy. This is my enemy. This makes my life miserable. You make my life miserable. I make my life miserable. It's miserable as long as I continue to tell that story. Now, I don't know of another story. I get it. That's what he says. You became trapped in a certain narrative. That's my only story. But if I could become aware of the trap, I could start telling myself other stories about myself, my spouse, my children, my God, my family, my friends, my community, and ultimately the whole world. What do we do now? Continues, here's the advice. What has to happen now is to be able to accept with faith, even when I'm in darkness, that the true energy of everything is only from Hashem, even if in my perception, I cannot appreciate it. In other words, I don't have to run away. I'm facing these thoughts or these experiences or these emotions or these realities. And it's so scary. It's so dark. Yosef is here, the prime minister of Egypt. He's such a scary man. And now he wants to kidnap my brother and make him a slave because he decided that he's a thief. And my father is going to die from all of this. And I'm responsible. I'm going to be the criminal for the rest of my life in this world and in the next world. You don't know how it's going to work out. You don't understand how it's going to work out. You don't see where God is here because I don't have that clear vision of reality. I have a lot going on in me. But can you stay here? Can you stay here with a conviction and a deep emuna that even though there's darkness here and even though there's confusion, there is divine opportunity here. There is divine energy here. Everything is ultimately an aspect of the divine. There's a spark of Hashem in this situation, in this person, in these circumstances, ultimately here to help you 
achieve your mission and reveal God's oneness in the situation. When a person can really experience this conviction. When a person can really, really accept this, and I'm adding, it's not easy because my brain is going to play games with me. My brain is going to say, no, 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 this is horrible, this is bad, you're traumatized, you're scarred, you're wounded, you're hopeless, this is a hopeless situation. When a person can really, really have compassion for their thoughts, but understand that there is a deeper way of looking at reality, and then the person could surrender their soul with true humility to try to touch the true essence of what's happening. That is what Yehuda says. Yehuda tells Yosef, I'm going to stay here. I will become your slave instead of Binyamin. What does this represent? I'm going to remain here. I know that there is, there is goodness here. I know that there is growth here. I know that the divine is here. I don't know how. This is a ridiculous situation. I don't know how we ended up in this mess. Of course, they ended up in this mess because they sold Yosef. But right now, I don't know. I am confused. I am overwhelmed. But I'm going to trust I'm not going to run away from the pain. I'm not going to run away from reality because we often do, you know, fight or flight. I'm going to remain present and hold on to the truth that I am God's ambassador. I am infinite. I am Hashem's light in this world. And I'm here to reveal the light in everywhere and everything. Yehuda goes out of his brain. He transcends his brain. He surrenders his soul to the infinite mystery of God's oneness in every single moment. And he becomes the ultimate brother who sacrifices everything to be a guarantor for Binyamin. He says, when a person is ready to surrender their brain and their ego and their fear, which he calls him a serious nefesh, surrendering my own perception of what my life is supposed to look like, I'll say that again, surrendering my own perception of what my life is supposed to look like. And I have to do it truthfully, without agendas, without objectives, without manipulation. He says, asking one question, what is my divine mission at this moment? That's my question. If I could go out of everything, all my expectations, all my stories about who I am and who I'm not, I can really open myself up to infinity. I can go out of my ego, go out of my fear, go out of my insecurity. I may not be able to get rid of them, but at least I can quarantine them. In other words, I could see them for what they are, have compassion, and then open myself up to another story. You know what happens? Yosef can't contain himself. And he says, I'm Yosef. And suddenly, all the goodness of the moment emerges. All the goodness in these circumstances emerges. That person who you perceived as your ultimate arch enemy turns out to be your best friend in the world. This becomes a glorious moment of family unification. Not only is Binyamin not taken as a slave, Binyamin is now celebrated and reunited with his long lost brother, his only whole brother from his father and mother. Yaakov can ultimately be reunited with his child. Wow! He says Yosef represents the Pnimius and everything because Yosef, on the outside, he looked like an Egyptian. On the inside, he was a child of Yaakov. On the outside, the brothers thought that he was the black sheep of the family. On the inside, he was completely aligned with the divine. So Yosef always represents the Pnimius, the inside story. Maybe not the outside story, the inside story. The Pnimius can't contain itself anymore and it bursts out. He says, because really, the inside was always divine. The inner core of all your thoughts, all your adversity, all your traumas, even if it was caused by people, 
who made the most horrible choices and decisions, but ultimately there's an inner, inner divine spark there that is there to bring out the best in you and to turn you into a blessed person, into a powerhouse of love and light and hope and spirituality. But it's so painful and I'm going through all these journeys and I have to have compassion for every single step of the way. And realize that because of the distortions of life, the truth becomes eclipsed. The klipa means a shell, it's a husk. It eclipses reality as though there is something separate from Hashem and from Hashem's oneness. When I can surrender my expectations and my versions of reality and how things have to play out according to my brains and I have to stop controlling the reality, I can allow myself to fall into the embrace of divinity even if my brain presently can't grasp it. You know what happens? I find out that my greatest enemy was my best friend. Yosef is really my brother. And what that means in my life is that those thoughts, those experiences, those emotions that were my greatest enemy really are here to bring out my deepest, deepest light. And then they become transformed because they fulfill their purpose. V'zehu bi'adoini says this, Fasemis, these are the words that Yehud opens up the conversation. He goes to Yosef and he says, Be adoini. Very strange words. Be adoini literally means, what does it mean? Be adoini. You know what it literally means? Be in me adoini, my master. What does it mean? Says this Fasem is Shehem in Shemikal Makoim Yesh Bipnimi Yusei Chayus Hashem Yisbarch. Afshen Nistelo Yveni Yedeya Heich. Kol Zagarim Hachet. Avol Beem is Be Adoni. Kein Yesh Bechol Hester Kama. He says, Yehuda had to tell himself those moments, Be Adoini. The Master is inside of me. The Master Hashem is inside of me. My core is filled with divine energy. That's who I am. I am an ambassador of God. I am an aspect of Hashem in this world. Can I tell that to myself? Can I go to that space where I am completely aligned with divinity? There's nothing separating me from Hashem. Be Adoni. Yes, it is eclipsed from me. Part of my brain is telling me that's not true because there were distortions in my life that took me away from that. But that's the truth. It remains the truth even if I'm not fully conscious and cognizant of it. And this is true in every concealment that you face. Be Adoni. Inside here is Hashem. Don't be afraid. And even if there is tremendous fear, look at that fear, create space for that fear, understand where that fear is coming from. It's coming from the notion that you're fragmented, that you're detached. Oh, now we come to understand the depth of the Medrash. The Medrash says when Shlaima tells his son, if you're a guarantor for your friend, what should you do? You stretched out a fr- uh, your hand to a stranger. You got stuck through the words of your mouth. You were ensnared. You're trapped. Go humble yourself before your friend. Go extol him. Make him your melech. What does all this mean? Now we understand. Yehuda and Yosef's story is a metaphor for all of life. We have become guarantors for the divine because we are the divine. But often we become misaligned. We become disaligned with our true selves. I'm not connected anymore. I have given my soul elsewhere. And my mouth has trapped me the way I speak, the way I think, the way I communicate, the way I live. And this is the time to humble myself to the situation I'm facing, to the darkness I'm facing, and realize that God is right here, but I must have the humility, because if I don't have the humility then I will remain stuck in my narrative of negativity and toxicity. Can't have a class without the word toxicity, sorry. I will remain stuck in my anxiety and my stress. And you know what? I have good reasons for it. The world is a dark place. I am a dark person. My brain is filled with darkness and depression and melancholy. But if I can humble myself, humble myself to the true essence which is right now beyond me, it's infinite. And I can realize that right here in this reality there's tremendous truth. Yehuda's not running away from Yosef. Yehuda doesn't say, I'm not going to deal with the situation. I'm going to remain present here and I'll be here for life. I'm here. 
because God is here. Because this is where reality is. This is where the light is. And suddenly he can discover the light. Now we go back to that last medrash that we quoted. You remember about Yosef's rebuke. And now we could finally understand. Now we'll finally understand that second medrash. The Blazer ben Azariah says, when we realize the power of Yosef's rebuke and how the brothers couldn't deal with it, we'll understand how we will not be able to withstand God's rebuke. But there was no rebuke here. So this Fasema says, now we'll get it. What does this mean? And what is he even trying to tell us? He's just trying to tell us, guys, get scared because when God starts rebuking you, you're done. You're chopped liver. You're finished. What's the point? What's the point of this medrash? Let's see the deeper element of Teres HaBal Shem Tev, how the Baal Shem Tev and his students look at this medrash. The words that the Torah uses is, when Yosef told them, I'm Yosef, la yachlu echav, they couldn't respond because they were astounded they were shocked they were startled they were overwhelmed from his face it doesn't say from him from his face says this doesn't mean they were terrified he's going to take revenge means they were overwhelmed in awe startled astounded Miponov, from his pnimius, from his core, from his inside. Sheikh Zikul Goy. They thought he's the Gentile, the Prime Minister of Egypt. Paro's right hand, another antisemite. Suddenly they saw that their perception was so wrong. They have erred in their perception. The doors of the perception were completely blocked. They never saw, they didn't see the truth. They thought they're talking to a Gentile, the viceroy of the great superpower of the time, Egypt. And really, they did not recognize that beneath the garbs, there was Yosef, a child of Yaakov, a grandchild of Yitzchak, a great grandson of Avram Avinu. Unbelievable words. They were so ashamed that their own alienation of him caused them to transform such a light into such darkness. They suddenly realized the story of their lives. They took the most precious light and they transformed it into darkness because of their own inability as youngsters to recognize Yosef. They never saw the Pneumius of Yosef. They thought he is their enemy. They thought he is the ultimate stranger. Even as a brother, they didn't recognize him as a brother. They didn't open themselves up to the relationship. They ran away from it. So what happens? In their own mind, he becomes indeed the most estranged person in the world. He becomes the epitome of darkness. And suddenly now he says, Ani Yosef. Nivalumi Panov. What caused them so much shame, so much pain was the pnimis. They suddenly saw the dissonance they were living in. What they thought is their greatest enemy was really their best friend. Those relationships that you are running away from because you are so threatened by them is really, it's the doing of my own mind. My own mind turns my enemies, my friends into my enemies. It turns that which seems so much so painful. It's my adverse, this is my adverse, this is, he is my adversary. And when I say he, it's not only somebody outside of you, it's somebody inside of me. And really, these are all my best friends. These are all my opportunities to be able to reveal my oneness, God's oneness, because I'm an ambassador of God. Like he said in the beginning, the whole world is under you. The whole world is part of you. The whole world is here for you. The world is your best friend. But I live in a world, I go into a place where my best friend becomes my greatest enemy. And this is very painful realization. It's such a painful realization. They have nothing to say. Says Rebbe Loza ben Azayah, You know what happens at the day of judgment? And I love these words that he's going to say because, you know, we always look at the day of judgment. You know, God is going to come down with a hammer and strike you down for all your sins. He says, let's understand what this really means. 
The day of judgment means the day when everyone will see the truth. When a person will realize that that which I perceived as the greatest abomination, that which I perceived as the worst, as the most terrible of realities, really, the inner energy of it was divine. It was sacred. That's the Yom Hadin, that's the day of judgment. And yet, my choices turned this godliness into so much negativity. What is this Fasemas telling us? <clears throat> Everything is part of the divine. Everything. And my relationship with it must be that. It must be one of positivity, one of cheerfulness. The perspective of holiness allows me to see in everything an opportunity to serve Hashem, an opportunity to reveal God's oneness. Sometimes God wants me to embrace certain things. Sometimes He says, this is not for you. Don't eat this. Don't engage in these relationships. Don't go to these places. That's also a way of serving God. It's also a way of revealing God's oneness in the world. The water I can drink because it's a kosher drink. Some wines I can drink over there. I can't make a bracha by the priyagaf and I have to say no to these wines. But everything is part of a story of oneness. Even that which is an abomination, even that which is negative, even that which is traumatizing, even that which is so immoral, is also ultimately given vitality. He says, the chiyus is kadosh ma'id. Even that has divine energy. And how do I access the divine energy? I access the divine energy by living and relating to it in a way that is aligned with the divine will, as they articulated in Shulchan Aruch. So this is kosher, this is not kosher. But even that which is not kosher also has divine purpose in it. It also has a holiness in it. The way I fulfill its purpose is by not bringing it into my life. Certain th- you need boundaries, certain things I don't go, certain things I don't say, certain things I don't do, certain things I don't need, certain things I'm not involved in, certain words and actions and thoughts are beyond my realm. It's, 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 it's compromising my integrity, my soul. What happens when the person loses touch with who they really are. They take an opportunity for closeness and instead it becomes a situation that causes them distance. He says, you took something that could have brought you so close to yourself and I used it in a way that it alienated me from my source. And when I suddenly realized that, there's such a deep sense of of shame. How did I not get it? How did I not see that really the whole world is cheering for me? Everything I come in contact with is God giving me an opportunity to reveal His light in the world. But for this, I have to have the confidence of knowing who I am. When I know who I am, everything I come in contact with, everything, even if externally, it seems like there's nothing promising here and it's just trying to tempt me to destructiveness and to depression and to sin. Really, it's an opportunity to make me aware, it's an opportunity for growth, it's an opportunity for alignment, it's an opportunity to bring out the good in myself and bring out the good in other people, always, everything, because there's always oneness. But when I'm not aligned with that, I fall prey to the external facade, and I say, ah, this is not divine, on the contrary, this is the opposite. And often it's tempting in one way or another. I just want to go to that place. And I take something that was really so holy and so sacred and I transform it to negativity. And in my mind, that's what it becomes. And now I live in that pattern of negativity. What happens when Yosef reveals himself to his brothers? He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't have to rebuke them. The deepest rebuke is not the rebuke that comes from me screaming at you or me telling you how bad you are. That's not real rebuke. That creates defensiveness. You know what real rebuke means? Real rebuke is when I have the courage and the love to open you up to who you really are. That's the deepest rebuke. The deepest rebuke is not I tell you, oh, you're a a low life, you're despicable, you're horrible, you're immoral. Okay, so we don't speak again. You won't talk to me again. That's not rebuke. Real toichecha, heichech teichiech, it says twice, the Baal Shem says, before you rebuke somebody else, you have to rebuke yourself. 
real rebuke is, can I show somebody who they really are? Can I teach them? Can I show them their niggin? Can I show them their song? Can they learn the patterns of their brain and see where they went wrong and how they managed to alienate themselves from themselves? Can I do that for them? Yosef did that when he said two words, Ani Yosef, I am Yosef. Wow. We turned our brother into our enemy. And this was our doing because of how we perceived our brother back then. And what we made a terrible mistake and that mistake came to haunt us and it changed the trajectory of our lives and now they want to rediscover a new story for their lives. That's the ultimate Yom Adin. If Yosef can do this, Abba Zeman Azariah says, Hashem, who is the source of every single person, who is your deepest and best friend, when he reveals himself, in everything, suddenly you see this is Hashem, and this is Hashem, and this is Hashem, and every thought is Hashem, and every person is an aspect of Hashem, and every aspect is a part of Hashem. And it's all here for me to be able to help bring His light in the whole world and show the oneness. I'm like, why was I living such a small and petty and insecure life when I was destined, I am destined, to be an ambassador of infinity? And he finishes, Vahavin. I hope you understand this. Ki'ein laheirich. There's really no time to elaborate. Shekasek farba makamachim, as I already once wrote about this, and therefore he says, Vahavin. I hope you'll be able to understand and appreciate the message. Indeed. Let's take some questions. Oh, thank you for posting the source sheet on chat in the Zoom. So you see, you can open the, you can open the, the source sheet on the chat in the Zoom. Question number one. You say that the Baal Shem Tev taught that we are each other's sugar cube. I wish and pray that in fact you're right, that when one Jew meets another Jew, he or she thinks of the other as a sugar cube, that they sweeten my life. When I see that it doesn't appear that way, reading comments Jews make about each other that are not so flattering, it makes me so sad. What can we do to change that? What can we do as individuals to show each other the incredible positive energy that would come from actually being that way? I have my ideas about it and I try to do my part, but so often I feel helpless and impotent when actually talking to those who have such incredibly negative attitudes about each other. I think our very teaching today gives us so much perspective. You know, sometimes people remain trapped in a certain narrative of how to look at themselves and others. If you can see this in yourself, you can see this in others. If you stop judging your own negativity and have compassion on the stories you told yourself and then open yourself up to a larger story, you'll be able to see this in other people and help them see this in themselves. But this, these are the types of things that we have to learn and teach and internalize. You can take such a class or similar classes, share it with people and become a living example of this. And remember, you talk about people being negative towards other people. Maybe that negativity itself is coming from your own perception. And what I mean by that is, you're looking at a certain aspect of their lives. Just like the brothers looked at Yosef and they saw him as a very negative person. Really, he was their brother. If I myself can really go into my own infinite light, I could start seeing that infinite light in people and seeing through their negativity and not getting stuck there and helping them see themselves that way and bring out in them glorious potential. Think about what I said.
You say God is our best friend. I believe that He is, but there are, there are times I even know it and feel it. But it's not always clear with, it's not always clear. I suddenly realized that He sends messages to me constantly, but it doesn't always feel that He's a best friend. Yeah, you're right. Sometimes there's a lot of pain. And I have to hold on. This is what emuna is. Emuna is the, the resilience, the fortitude, the conviction, the faith that even in the darkness there is divine love. Is this true what you're saying that everything, really everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, even the seemingly negative things that happen to us is always good? It's always for our growth and realization, for our connection with each other and God? To hold on to this idea, this truth, is transformative. But do you really believe this? And is it possible for a person to live this way? It's not a simple thing just to internalize and say, yeah, everything is good, 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 sweet and dandy. Remember, there, is also, there are also the people who as a result of this teaching, when they don't internalize it, they just go out for lunch. They become aloof, they detach from the world, and they say, oh, everything is good and dandy, but it's really a way of avoiding pain. Sometimes when the world is so painful, you say, oh, everything is good, everything is good, everything is good, I don't allow myself to feel it. That's not what we're talking about. Yehuda felt the pain. Yosef felt the pain. There was a lot of anguish, there was a lot of pain. So this is a very, very deep and mature and emotional process. It's not about escapism or detachment from reality. It's about connecting to reality and holding on to reality, and experiencing the covers of reality, and feeling the pain of the break of the, of the brokenness, and the fragmentation, and the dissonance, and yet allowing ourselves to open ourselves up to a deeper story beneath the pain and inside the pain. And that's the story of ultimate, ultimate oneness and goodness, and that the whole world and everything in your life is here to help you fulfill your divine mission as an ambassador of oneness. Is it counterintuitive? The Svasema says, really, it's the most intuitive way to live. It's our organic way of living. But our brains often distort our reality. That's why we need to learn and meditate and pray and connect and learn more and always practice and exercise. Exercise this lifestyle and it reinforces it and it creates new neural pathways. We know in neuroscience we create new neural pathways that allow us to approach things in a different fashion. Next question. The way I understand it is that the Svasemis reminds us to maintain alignment with our true purpose. This means to distance ourselves from misalignment, which is what Yehuda had to do at that moment. But notice the background before Yehuda gave himself as a guarantor. Was Yosef's immaturity, self-beautification, tail-bearing, haughtiness, disclosing his dreams, was that proper alignment? Was Yaakov's favoritism of Yosef, proper alignment? Was, were the brothers' plot to kill, actual throwing him into the pit, proper alignment? Nobody would say that these were proper alignments. These were distortions. But even things that would have been at the time mis improper alignment, they turned around to have a hidden secret of alignment. Because by Yosef being thrown into the pit and the brothers sinning, ultimately he becomes the viceroy and he saves them. So what this means is that we need to have the perspective glasses to see that present seemingly negative, non-aligning events will later turn out to positive aligning matters. There is not much merit to call obvious good good. There is merit to see the hidden secret inner good that comes garbed as seemingly bad to see it now as an opportunity for growth. So maybe the whole Yosef story is designed to save the fledgling Jewish nation from starvation and later fulfill God's promise that his descendants would be slaves and be redeemed. Iron that is hardened by alternating extreme cold and heat becomes tempered steel, much stronger 
and rust resistant compared to untempered iron. Thank you. I have another question. The brothers transformed Yosef's light into darkness. Wasn't that supposed to happen? Wasn't that part of God's intervention in our lives? We had to go into exile. We had to go through all of this. The brothers had to sell Yosef. Wasn't all of this part of the plan? Well, it was certainly part of the plan. However, you do have to understand that when they were doing it, sometimes when we act... We don't feel that it's part of the plan. We just do our thing. God has a plan, and later, when we align ourselves with God and we do real tshuva, then retroactively, we could see that what we were doing was part of the plan. But for this, we have to go through our own process of, uh, of realignment. Okay. Let's take another question. This is from Zoom. Question is as follows. If this is true, what if I have family members who are toxic? And as you said, they're using survival tactics they learned as a child. And now as adults, they have difficulty understanding that their immediate family is bringing them down. Basically, they're in denial. Is it Lashon Hara to tell them they are bringing him down, have tried to make peace, but they are extremely controlling and are not looking for this person's interest. So somebody has toxic family members. They're bringing another family member down. And I want to explain to him to protect himself. I'm not sure exactly what the question is. But of course, if you feel that you can help somebody from being manipulated... You should try to help them. Try to help them in the, in, the, in the most kind but firm and respectful way. You're allowed to help somebody from, from being damaged, of course. Well, it's our responsibility. Everything you shared resonates. I've definitely experienced this to be true in my everyday life. How do you reconcile these ideas and avoid a negative narrative when faced with real pain you witness around you? Some things are beyond perception. A child in an oncology ward. You see the faithful suffer. You see mind-numbing tragedies. How do you understand the ideas that mindset creates reality in this context? We don't yet live in a world where all the darkness can be seen for what it is. This is what gullus means. Gullus means there is dissonance, there is exile. Exile means I'm not at home. I'm in exile. What does that mean spiritually? There's no full alignment. We don't see the world for what it really is. When we face these tragedies, we cry. We get a lump in our throat. We feel numb. We often feel paralyzed. We get angry. There is sometimes denial, anger, right? Bargaining, grief, sometimes just complete frustration. It takes away our vitality. We feel like everything is just worthless and everything is evil and bad. And we have to respect the fact that these are the perceptions based on our appreciation of reality, our finite appreciation of reality. There's not much to say to help somebody believe that everything is good by telling them, oh, it really looks bad, but it's wonderful. That plays with people's emotions. If somebody loses a loved one, God forbid, somebody really struggling with the health of a child, it's pain, it's dark. In the words of the Svasemes, lahamin be'muna b'choyshech ki ha'chayis rak ma'ashem yizbarach af she'toche nov mirois. I have to know that sometimes my eyes will not perceive the hidden reality. Yosef is dressed up with many, many layers of concealments. And I have to accept that. And I have to know that the pain is very real. And there's an unfathomable reality. Circumstances that are, as you said, mind-numbing and heart-numbing. And really accept that. And accept that that's also part of the purpose. 
Remember, just as God's energy is in every event, God's energy is also in every perception of every event. There's also God's energy there. The fact that I'm feeling so painful, so, the fact that I'm feeling so much pain and I'm feeling so much paralysis and so much numbness, there's also God's energy there. That's also when you say, Lekabal Yisurim Ba'ava, it doesn't only mean everything is good and dandy. For, for many of us, it's not good and dandy. But can I accept the fact that there is purpose and there is love even in that experience? That's part of what God wants for me now, to have a, num, a, a mind-numbing experience. Because if not, I'm not human. Moshe Rabbeinu, when he saw the Jews suffering, he didn't say, God knows what he's doing. It's good. Let's dance. Let's say L'chaim. He cried and he said, Lama Salama Zeh. Why are you afflicting the people? Moshe, come on. You're the ultimate believer. Because he was a believer. He can empathize with the people. He felt what they're experiencing. These are mind-numbing experiences. These are oppressive experiences. You can't just tell a person, you know, make believe it's all good. It's all really good. There's purpose. God is here. Enoid Mulvada. Start dancing at the funeral. Chas v'shalom. That's against the Torah itself. The same Torah who says this also says that on Tisha B'Av we fast. We don't dance. And there's something called Shiva. Why don't they just go dancing? Everything is good. And the answer is because there's the human perception of reality is also divine. That's also meaningful. That's also purposeful. That's part of the problem. Now you say, why does God need all this? I don't know the answer to this. We don't have an answer for individual pain always. The finite brain cannot grasp the infinity of God and cannot grasp the infinity in every situation. And I have to be able to surrender to that. I have to be able to be humble without, about that. I have to be able to understand that I don't understand. I have to be able to accept and be humble about the fact that I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know the purpose. I don't know the meaning. I don't know why. I don't see the sweetness. I don't always see the sugar cube. Can I really, really humbly accept that and hold on to the reality, not by denying it and not by avoiding it, but by staying here and remaining here and not being afraid of looking into it. And deep, deep, deep down somewhere there, I will find, maybe not reasons, but I will find meaning, I will find purpose, I will find energy, I will find God. Now these are very deep ideas. They're very personal, they're very intimate, they are serious they're very serious. These things should not be said lightly and with no judgmentalism. And it's always with respect to the process of people because that process is also divine. That's his point. In everything there is divinity, including the way I process things. And therefore I have to have compassion for that process. I have to have compassion even for the fact that I am processing things in a dark way. Even that itself is also divine, and that therefore will help bring me closer to reality. So don't run. the main thing is not to run away from the reality. I hope I addressed your question at least a little bit. Next question. You speak, you mentioned about a toxic family. If there are toxic family members who are bringing someone down, I cannot see how peace can be made at this point with these family members. What does it mean to be aligned with God? Does God want me to stay away from them because peace is not possible? Is this a test? Do I have to still be close to them? What God wants from you in this situation is to be able to ask yourselves what is the best behavior, what is the best line of behavior right now possible in order to bring the most goodness and light and hope into the world. It's probably important to have an objective person who cares for you but who is not afraid to challenge you somebody who's wise and understands the situation, has empathy, 
to be able to guide you. Maybe you need better boundaries with these family members as a prelude to make peace. The ultimate objective is always peace. But to get to peace, sometimes you need strong boundaries. You need to protect yourself. You need to consolidate yourself. And then you can relate to them from a place of strength and not from weakness. So the objective is peace. How that peace is made, sometimes by talking, sometimes by confronting the situation, sometimes by bringing in a mediator, an arbitrator, a therapist, a rabbi, whatever it may be. Sometimes you need better boundaries. Sometimes the communication needs help. Sometimes you have to go to therapy with a family member. Sometimes you just have to have a good conversation. We have to learn to stop, to stop right away thinking negatively and accuse the other person always of malicious intent. We try to give people the benefit of the doubt, see the goodness in them, but maybe at this stage you still need good boundaries. You have to protect yourself because there's too much toxicity in them or in you or in the combination and the dynamic. And then when you build yourself up, you can reapproach the situation from a stronger place. Sometimes there is real abuse and real dysfunction and you need to really create very firm boundaries to protect yourself, protect the children. I don't know the situation, so I cannot give any specific advice outside of the generic advice that we always ask ourselves, what is my mission in this moment? How can I bring the most light and goodness into myself and into the people around me and into the relationships and into the home? And what is necessary for everybody to ultimately live with their own inner infinite light? Next question. Can you find godliness in tragedy by knowing that my perception that is dark is also God? Both are true at the same time. The dark and the light that we cannot see. Yes, very well said. Very well said. And a real humility and a real emuna that my brain will not be able to turn everything into a puzzle that mathematically makes sense to me. And to be able to be, to be in that, the darkness and the light ultimately live together. Because till Mashiach comes, the light is often dark, garbed in darkness. So holding on to that darkness is also holding on to God. And that's what Yehuda did. He held on to that relationship with Yosef as the prime minister. He said, I'm going to stay here with you. I'm going to stay here with you. And he stayed there with him. You know what happened? He saw Yosef. He saw Yosef. And that's the Yom Hadin. That's the ultimate day of judgment. The ultimate day of judgment is the doors of perception are cleansed. And I get to see what all of reality really is. What I am, who I really am, what my life is about, what the people around me are, what the world is, and what all the circumstances in my life are. Can men listen to this shear too, or it's only for women? Men can listen to the class. In fact, a lot of men listen to it. And the class is available on theyeshiva.net, so people can listen to it. It could be men and women. I think this is, a, this is a class for everybody. Next question. You said that I am, each and every one of us, is an ambassador of infinity in our day-to-day life. What can that look like? What can that look like? It's a beautiful question. And uh, you know what the, probably the hardest part in this is? It's too good to be true. <laughs> You know when we think it's too good to be true? We have a mindset that negativity somehow makes more sense than positivity. It's like, give me the bad news, I can deal with it. I can quetch. The good news, oh, how do you deal with good news? You know, some of us, we have repetitive patterns in our brain that tell us bad news. I don't mean news, you know, news in the newspapers or on the radio. I mean news of how we relate to life. So like the bad news, yeah, we're used to it, you know. Life is horrible. The world is a crazy place. Everybody's meshuga. I'm the first one who's meshuga. You know, oh, if I have a calm day, wow, that was, uh, you know, some uh, coincidence, some mazel. But the truth is, it's the other way around. It's like, it's not too good to be true. This is truth. Why would a loving God create you in the world? Just to suffer? God just wants you to suffer? 
and then to try to pray that he alleviates the suffering. And he puts you in the world, he gives you all these temptations and all these challenges, but he says, but if you sin, I'm going to punish you. There's something off about it. God is infinite love. And you're part of that infinite love. And the purpose is to be able to experience that infinite love every moment, to be aligned with that infinite love. And the whole world is part of that love. But for this, I can't be fixed in my stories and what things have to look like because then I get frustrated and then I'm busy controlling my life. I really want to open myself up to the infinite love. Now, these are not words. If you just take them as words, you're missing the point and I'm missing the point. I have to breathe this in. I have to be able to, to internalize this. And it's, it's, it's daily work. This is Avaidis Hashem. What does it mean to serve God? What does serving God mean? We say, I was created to serve God. The Mishnah says at the end of Kiddush, what does that mean? This is the basic definition of serving God. It's constantly beginning when I open my eyes in the morning, aligning myself with this truth. I am an ambassador of infinity because I am infinity. Ain't safe. That's what it is. Should we take some more questions? I don't know how to relate to this practically. Anything you said. I'm struggling with my children. What does this mean practically? When I'm struggling with my children, I'm struggling with my marriage. Can you explain this practically? <laughs> Well, I think that's exactly what he's talking about, no? When we're struggling with something, whatever we're struggling with, don't deny the struggle. Don't make believe it's not a struggle. There's a struggle. This is about changing ourselves. It's about changing my attitude. Instead of seeing the people in my life that I'm struggling with as the enemy. I want to be able to see my thoughts and the power of my thoughts to recreate the narrative. That's what I want to do. I want to change my attitude towards it. Instead of seeing these things as my enemy, see these things as my opportunities that God has given me in order to be able to truly be an ambassador of love at this moment. But for this, I have to go out of a place of ego and insecurity and a place of control. I want to control you. You are causing me pain and distress because you're not giving me the nachas that I expected. Because that keeps me stuck in a place of detachment. When I realize, who am I? I'm an ambassador of Hashem in the world to bring light into the world. And the whole world is filled with his light. And everything that comes my way is an opportunity to bring out that light inside of me and to help me share that light with others. So then I see the reality. I see the disappointment. I grieve for an alternate reality that I hoped for. I grieve for it because it's dark. Yosef and the brothers, there was a lot of tears there. They were separated for 22 years. This was painful. It was not the... It's not the family you dream of, having brothers sell a brother and then meet him 22 years later. It's a beautiful story at the end, but it's riddled with, it's it's, it's saturated with pain. I can grieve for a different story. But then I say, but this is the story of my soul. This is my shlichus, this is my mission. I can embrace it. I can embrace it with tears but I can embrace it with good spirits. And when I embrace it with tears, I can then go to the good spirits. I can go deeper and find the joy. (sighs) Okay, what does Texas have to say about all this? What does Jerusalem have to say about all this? What does California have to say about all this? What does London have to say about all this? What does South Africa have to say about all this? I'm just introducing some of our guests here today. (laughs) What does Muncie have to say about all this? What does Brooklyn have to say about all this? What does the five towns have to say about all this? 
What does Miami have to say about all this? <laughs> what does Jerusalem have to say about all this? Wherever you are, I'm very thankful that you have joined us today on this journey. And it was a very meaningful and special journey. And may each of us, including myself, be able to become these people that we talk about. You know, it always begins inside. I want to become the person that I want other people to be. I want to become that person who radiates this type of perceptiveness. And you know what happens? You'll inspire a lot of people around you to start radiating it, radiating it as well. Have a beautiful day and a meaningful day to all of you. Thank you. You can unmute yourself if you want. <laughs>